Hello everybody, this is Austin Greathouse with Cali, and welcome to our webinar on uh, Twitter from a law professor's perspective, presented by Professor Jonathan Ezor. Uh, just a little bit about the Cali webinars, uh, produced at Cali from www.cali.org for more on our organization. Um, we do this pretty much every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern. A free service for our Cali member schools and we would really like your feedback on these and, and we'd like suggestions for what we can do as far as topics involving legal education, technology and legal education. Uh, just shoot me an email if you have any feedback for us or have any suggestions. You can follow Cali and keep up with webinar announcements by uh, visiting our blog at cali.org slash blog. Uh, also follow us on Twitter, Cali Law School, or look for us on Facebook, facebook.com slash cali.org. And we are recording this, so you can check out the archives at calivideos.blip.tv and look for that up there as well as an archive of past webinars. Again, that's calivideos.blip.tv. And we have some upcoming webinars to tell you about. Uh, Deb Quintel, our Director of Curriculum Development here at Cali, has been doing a great series on how to write Cali lessons uh, using Cali Author. This is part three of her, her series in that. Um, so check that out. And on September 18th, uh, we also have uh, Sarah Glassmeyer, librarian at the University of Kentucky who will cover alternatives to course management systems using things like wikis and blogs. So that should be a great, just a great uh, webinar. So, and I also want to note that uh, on the call today, John Mayer, our executive director, and that's him, <laughs> and also the presenter is Jonathan Ezor, like I said. Uh, okay, so as far as questions go, if you have questions throughout, we're going to try to save questions for the end of the webinar this time. Uh, you can use your chat function or question function and send me those questions and let me know uh, what those are. So, Professor Jonathan Ezor is uh, from, from the Toro Law Center. Uh, I'm going to let him take over now if he's ready. All right. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much. I don't know if there we go. There we go. Um, let me just get the right window open. And uh, hopefully all of you can see that. Let me just pull up my audience view to make sure. Sorry for the delay. Just uh, trying to get this done. There we go. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Austin. And John, and thank you all of you for attending. I appreciate it. What I want to do today is give you a sense of where, how and where I see Twitter in the law professor's world. I am about three days or four days shy of a year on Twitter, although I did not really become active on the service until I attended a conference earlier this year and spoke at it. And just saw the power of this service. And I'll explain what that is all about. Uh, I thought it would be useful to take this from almost a journalistic perspective. Not all of the five W's and an H, but what, how, and why about Twitter. What it is, how one uses it or doesn't use it, and why. Where's the value proposition? What it is, of course, uh, is a social network. Talk about that a little bit more. It connects people virtually uh, and enables communication one to one, one to many, many to one. But it's different in both kind and function from a lot of the other networks that you may use, hear about, be familiar with, MySpace, certainly Facebook and LinkedIn. 
And there is real value that law professors, along with every other profession, uh, can find from it. So what is it? It's a service. People are familiar with the website, which is just twitter.com. But what the Twitter organization has done, I believe from the very start, is open it up beyond the website. Cre uh, publish an API, a programming interface that allows other software developers and other websites to connect to the service, reach, uh, reach the content, and allow users to view it in ways that the Twitter website just doesn't permit. It's Twitter website's very simple, easy to use, not very sophisticated, not a lot of tools on it for managing how many tweets you get, managing with whom you're communicating, finding useful information. The Twitter website, is, as I'll show you a sample in a few minutes, is one, one size fits all. But these many tools allow you to customize your experience and get the most out of it. The service itself is only about two and a half years old, and the company goes back a year. You know, dot-com time, I guess. That means decades. But it's very new. And in a lot of ways, people haven't quite figured out why, which we'll get to, or even what Twitter is all about. But there are millions throughout the world who are using it. That became very clear most recently during the Iran elections when Twitter, because of the way the infrastructure worked, was, was able to be a conduit for Iranians trying to get the word out about the elections in the aftermath when almost every other international communications channel was blocked. How does Twitter compare to the other services with which you may be familiar? Really it's much more focused than they are. Most of the other major social media services, social media communities, are multifaceted. They offer a lot of different ways of using them. Some are more consumer, some are more business, but they're very varied. Facebook has walls and events and photo albums and quizzes and applications and not Twitter. There are very few embellishments to the basic Twitter functionality. LinkedIn, which many of us use to create and build our business networks, has a lot of the power of LinkedIn has to do with searching people by profession, by company, by affiliation. Uh, and using LinkedIn to connect to friends of friends of friends or colleagues of colleagues of colleagues to connect to people you can't otherwise get to directly. <clears throat> Again, Twitter, the search tools on Twitter are fairly limited, although as with Google, if you know what to do with the search tools that are there, you can get a lot of information, but you're not generally going to be able to search by who went to Turo Law Center or who worked at a particular law firm. It just doesn't work that way. The searches available in Twitter are generally about the names, both real names and the Twitter IDs, and the content of the messages of the tweets, not the affiliations. One other relevant difference between, say, Facebook or even LinkedIn and Twitter for law professors is our students are, by and large, not nearly as much on Twitter as they are on the other services. If you put yourself up on Facebook, your students are, see, are there and they're seeing you and they're posting to your wall and sometimes vice versa. Twitter less so. The demographics are different. <clears throat> so that is primarily the what. So let's talk about the how. To, to uh, paraphrase, it's all about the characters. Twitter is text-based, primarily. And it's a very limited text-based interface you have 140 characters to play with. 140 characters that have to be your entire message. That's not a lot, particularly not for uh, law professors who won't use one word when 300 will do quite nicely. And it's a challenge. It's a challenge to be concise. That's a good thing. 
It's writing, though. And people use it a lot of ways that they also use blogs. Twitter's sometimes called microblogging for that reason. It's similar to text messaging and sometimes has the same abbreviations, but yeah, not used the same way. Text messaging is primarily one to one. The nice thing about Twitter from a not being overwhelmed perspective is that your tweets, that's what they call the messages, although I read this week that uh, Twitter is having difficulty getting trademark protection for that word, but in any event, your tweets, your messages will only be seen by or sent to, I should say, those users who choose to follow you. You go on the Twitter website, you put in a user's name, you can click follow. Some of the programs we'll talk about allow you to do it also. It isn't like uh, a blog where everybody can see it. Uh, and the flip side is you only get the, the messages, the tweets from those people you follow. It makes it much easier to focus your reading and focus your tweeting uh, on an interested group of people. Uh, one exception, of course, is if people search for something that's in your message, they can find it too, but they have to go ahead and look for it. It's not automatic. Search can watch people. It can watch terms. And that, in a little while, gets you how that can be valuable. Twitter, like every other environment, has its own magic words, its own jargon, and its own commands. But they're very straightforward and simple. Every Twitter ID is preceded by the at sign. So if you put an at sign and then the Twitter ID, that will be a message that will be directed at the other person. You want to get my attention, either reply to something I say or tell me something or talk about me in your tweet, you write, for example, at Prof Jonathan, no spaces. If you only want the tweet to go to me, there is a private messaging feature. You put a D, the letter D, and a space before the username without the at sign, and it will go directly to, or the Professor Jonathan will go directly to me. But here's where Twitter really comes into its own. It works very hard to avoid spam. You can imagine the capability. You can send direct messages to any number of people, except very smart of Twitter. The only users to whom you can send direct messages are users who are following you, not people you follow. So let's say, for example, you've decided that you really want to send a direct message to Oprah Winfrey because you have a brand new fiction book you want to get on the book club. You can't get through by email, you can't get through by telephone or fax or whatever. You're going to send her a Twitter message directly to her and you hit D and then I don't even know because I'm assuming it's Oprah. I don't follow Oprah, I'm happy to say. No offense, it's not why I use Twitter. Um, unless Oprah has decided to follow you back She's not going to be able to, she's not going to get your direct message. You'll get back a response saying, user not following you. It really cuts down on unwanted messages. You may have people following you who are spammers and the like, but unless you follow them back, they can't send you a direct message. It's very nice that way. It's certainly a lot cleaner and a lot more useful content than in, for example, typical email accounts these days. A few other things you'll hear about and see on Twitter. Retweet. Twitter is not big on plagiarism. You're supposed to give credit where credit is due. Uh, but generally you do it with an RT, the letter of RT, a space, and then the user's name with the at sign. Why? So that the user knows that he or she is being retweeted and then whatever the message was. Sometimes you'll have to edit it to get down to the 140 characters, including the user's name and the RT. But it's a good way, if you see something of interest and want to tell people about it or comment on it, that's how you do it. Think of it like forwarding an email. But again, only to your users, your followers. Another thing you'll see often is hashtag. 
That's a little ha at, uh, hash pound sign before a word or a phrase with no spaces. Uh, Twitter is very good that any time uh, there is a space or punctuation mark, it knows that whatever was before it uh, went away, uh, is separate. So if you, the hashtag is really used to highlight for people the topic of your tweet. Why? Can't they read it? Sure, if they're following you. But oftentimes there is a series of tweets going on from a number of unrelated people, and they want them all to be grouped together. If they use a common hashtag, and the way, by putting that pound sign ahead of it, it separates it from simply the use of that word in, in a sentence, then other users can search for the hashtag, search for the word with the at sign, with the pound sign, excuse me, and be able to follow the conversation and then participate. There are some regular trends that happen every Friday. People use a, hash, uh, a pound sign and the word follow Friday to recommend other users. There are a whole bunches of other ones. Uh, but it's also good on the fly when there's a discussion going on or there's a conference, etc. And then, if you, as I said, it, it's about text, but there are third-party tools to allow you to post photos, to allow you to take a long link, to use up your 140 characters and turn it into a really small one, ways of making Twitter more functional and efficient. You can use the site for reading and replying, doing everything you need to do. There's even a search function, and Twitter is highlighting search now. They understand its value. But it can be much more helpful to choose another piece of software and use it to access Twitter because Twitter allows that. Whether it's TweetDeck, which I use, or Seismic Desktop, or a bunch of others for uh, desktop computers. I use Twee on my Palm Pre. TweetDeck is also available for iPhone. There are many, many others. There are BlackBerry clients. Almost any device you can imagine, you can access Twitter. And even from a cell phone, you can receive tweets and send them through text messaging directly. There's a URL here in the presentation, twitter.pbworks.com slash caps apps, which will give you a not even complete list, but a long list of both Twitter clients and analysis tools. And those tools can also help you figure out the value of Twitter and manage it. So let's see the comparison. Oh, one other thing, keep in mind, uh, when Twitter goes down, all these other clients go down too. It's one company and one service. August 6th, um, there was a, an attack, a denial of service attack on the Twitter site, reportedly going after a single user in the Republic of Georgia that brought the entire service down and with it all of the other software and all the other websites that depended on it. So uh, Twitter is very vulnerable. It's also vulnerable to overuse which will uh, generally show you this. This is the famous fail whale. It is Twitter's uh, picture for, sorry, it's not working right now. There are too many people trying to use it. Twitter's had some growing pains over the years. So if you hear the phrase, the word fail whale, this is the fail whale. He's very cute. You don't want to see him. So why? Why use Twitter? Well. If you listen to most media, it's so that you can find out what Ashton Kutcher or Oprah Winfrey are doing uh, or what people are having for breakfast. People use it like text message, and I guess that's true, but that's only one side of what Twitter can do and allows you to do. And the other side is that it's a tremendous and efficient business and knowledge resource. Many of us read blogs or email lists, and there's just a lot out there. And to go to each one, even if you get an RSS feed from them, to get each one and go through it, it's a long time. But Twitter is really focused, and it allows you to follow essentially tens or hundreds of bloggers and their ideas all at once in a very managed way. But it's not only about getting value. Ideally, it's about giving value as well. So how do you get value? One is to follow the leaders in your subject area. People who are tweeting about topics that you find of interest. You can find them by name, many law professors, uh, legal academics, etc., politicians, other thinkers are on Twitter. 
journalists too, or you can find them initially by keywords. Use the search function to find people talking about your interest, topics of interest with hashtags or not. And once you find out what the topics are in the hashtags, you can set them up as ongoing searches so that even if you're not following those people for every one of their messages, you will see when they post things of value. And the other nice thing is you can learn from your fellow users. Whom are they following? Whom are they retweeting? Twitter unfortunately changed its uh, interface a few months ago, making it harder to see to whom people are responding. But still, you can gain a lot of knowledge about other users whose tweets you might find valuable by watching your community and to whom they're responding, etc., and, and whom they're tweeting. As with everything else, it takes knowledge and practice to get the best value out of this. Learn how to use, whether it's the website or certainly the software, well. Uh, read the manual or the documentation, but find out all the really good features. Uh, another way to get value and some promotional value, having other people retweet your messages, is to make sure that they're short enough for easy retweeting. The rule of thumb is generally, unless you have a really long Twitter name, to have under 130 characters, and every Twitter client and the website will give you a, an ongoing count. Um, but think of it as the letters RT, a space, your Twitter name with the at sign, a space, and then the entire message. Unless it's shorter than about 125 or 130, you're, you're going to have to have the users who want to retweet it edit it. And they may not want to or they may not include everything you want. So if you're going for retweetable value, think short. Another way of getting value is not to auto-follow. Do not follow everyone who follows you. Many marketers and disreputable spammers will do that. They will follow you because they follow everyone in the hopes that you will then follow them back. Then, of course, they can market to you, direct message to you, all the rest. Turn off auto-follow if it's an option. Choose your following carefully. Just to compare, this is what the Twitter website looks like. You can see you've got, uh, it says, what are you doing at the top? That's where one puts one's own tweets. You've got the people I'm following, generally speaking. Uh, I'm sure you can learn a lot about me and my perspective from what you see. On the right side, you see where it says home, and then Professor Jonathan, direct messages, favorites, search, etc. cetera. Um, but it's all in one place, and you have to go from screen to screen in order to get everything. This is TweetDeck, which is a free Twitter client, runs on all sorts of platforms. It looks a little complicated, but what you see there are columns that I can manage just so I get just the information I want. Uh, and I arrange it the way I want it to. It, it's a much better thing to use one of the free clients. Uh, another way, more ways of I know we're running a little late. I'm happy to stay on a few minutes extra to take some questions. One is, as with all online communities, make sure you're consistent with your Twitter persona. It's a lot harder in Facebook because your high school friends can find you. But decide, is this your personal voice or your professional voice? And if you want to do both, you can, you're not violating any terms of use, set up separate accounts. Uh, for example, anyone who's ever met me knows I'm very big uh, into Palm handhelds, most recently the Palm Pre. And I decided my followers didn't want to hear about it. Or if they did, they could choose to follow my new username of Palm Pre Lawyer. So my non pre stuff stays within Prof. Jonathan. Uh, TweetDeck and the other clients also help you manage multiple accounts fairly easily. You add value by making it easy for people to find your stuff. Use hashtags. Again, make it easy to retweet. Ask yourself, before I hit this send for this 140 characters, will my followers be interested? Is this something that other people want to read? By the way, if you blog, if you have time to blog with everything else, uh, one nice thing about Twitter is you can mention, it's perfectly 
acceptable to mention your latest blog entry and provide a link to it. People who don't know about your blog will suddenly discover it. Uh, links are always useful. Think of them as footnotes. Use the, the URL shortener. If you see an article of interest, say, great article about X, then put the link. Let people read it if they want. You don't have much more than that with 140 characters. A right, quick word on why not or how not. Remember, Twitter is public. Even though you may have followers, and there are ways of limiting who follows you, most people don't use them. It really cuts out uh, what you're doing. And most people will be able to, uh, their tweets are public and searchable and archivable and forwardable. Remember that. Your students, even if I say the demographics say they're not on, they can be. I know at least one of my students, uh, probably more, I haven't looked yet, uh, is on right now. Uh, and I wave to her. But they will follow you. Your colleagues will be following you. You may not realize it, particularly if you get a lot of, uh, if they're using a different name or another account. Be aware of that. Future colleagues or potential ones may follow you. There are too many horror stories out there, happily most not in the legal or legal academic world, of people who didn't realize who was tweeting or watching them tweet. Uh, anyone who wants some of those horror stories, I'm happy to share them when we have some more time or you can contact me. Uh, and remember, your students, since I'm speaking as a professor, are looking to you for an example. At Turo, we're going to be doing an orientation session on social media, both best practices and best avoided practices. They're, they want to see that you are doing what you're telling them to do in terms of adding value and avoiding problems. That's the presentation uh, in a nutshell, pardon the phrase. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions that uh, people may have. And thank you. Okay, we, we do have some questions built up, Professor. Okay. Um, and also let me add, do, do our attendees see the hand raise tool? If you have a question, you can also, if you see that, go ahead and raise your hand right now. Just raise your hand if you can see the hand raising tool. See, a few of you are getting it. But if, okay, I'm going to lower your hands now. But if you have a question too, you can also raise your hand and I'll unmute you and you can ask in person. But I have some questions here. Um, do you know of anyone who has experimented with live Twitter feeds, like using hashtags during lectures? We've actually talked about it internally, a few of us who are uh, more Twitter active. It's certainly a tool that's available. I've, cert I've seen it with conferences. I ended up being part of a, a legal conference in another city. I didn't realize it was a conference. It just looked like an interesting discussion. Uh, the challenge there, though, is twofold. One, your students, if you want to have a discussion and have live tweeting in your class, many of us fight the attention eater, that is the internet, with our students and laptops, and you're really asking them to look down and be active and involved. Uh, the other challenge is because Twitter is this public tool, once you're having them on Twitter, it's very difficult to keep it only within the class. I think there are ways of using it. I'm not sure if real-time in-class is going to be the best one. Also, hashtags are searchable, so the discussion may well go beyond one's own class. Very interesting. That question was from Stuart Sierra. This one is from Sarah Hawk. How, mu how much time does it take to commit to Twitter from your perspective? Uh, uh, too much from my perspective. <laughs> Not that it does, but that it can. It's a very addictive flow of information. The tools that are out there help manage it. Uh, I would say don't overdo it. Use it as long as you're finding value. And be good about closing it. Twitter, it's very easy to use initially, uh, particularly if you find a few people to then follow who they're following and you start gaining your list slowly. Uh, don't go out and blast 100 tweets a day until you have a sense of what typical tweets look like. What are people using? What is the tone? What is the language? As with any online community. You want to make sure that you are being part of the discussion and not 
overwhelming people with what you're doing? I know that's a bit of a vague answer. Uh, Twitter can be an attention waster. The goal is to get more value than it eats up. Yes, I, I agree with that. You could spend all kinds of time on it, but you don't necessarily have to. Right. I mean, there's there's a return on there's a return on time investment also. Right. Uh, I've gotten many many opportunities, including I think this webinar, through my participation in Twitter, uh, are op opportunities to speak, to write, etc. Absolutely. And you do you are able to reach people you cannot get any other way. Maybe not with a direct message, but with a tweet. So if you focus on using it for your job, using it for the goals that you've set yourself. I think you'll find a lot of value there. Okay. Um, this one comes from, from John. Should, should law profs ask their students to get a Twitter account? Um, I would say yes for two reasons. One, because I think, or yes, except not during class. Uh, one, because there is information that happens, that, that comes through Twitter that it's hard to collect all in one place easily. And the other is, and that's is me speaking as a practitioner, Twitter is generating new legal issues. Uh, whether it's marketing law or defamation or confidentiality, legal ethics, a whole host. So understanding how Twitter works will enable your students when they graduate to give good advice to their clients who have Twitter related legal questions. Okay. Um, what else do we have here? Okay, are there any other questions? You can raise your hand if you have any questions. So I, I know we kind of covered this last time, but, or I'm sorry, last, uh, on an earlier question, but uh, Patricia Strum, oh, I'm sorry, David Cohen asked, is there any valuable way to use it as a part of class that you can see at um, all? Um, I can see, it depends on the class. There may be times when there's going to be live tweet of a relevant conference or event and having it up on a projected screen or on the students' laptops if everyone has, has to generate discussion I think can be valuable. There's a press conference about legislation. Seeing what people are saying about it in real time can be fascinating and very much educational. Another might be a, an at-home assignment to follow a particular hashtag, to, again, to see what people are saying, see how the thoughts compare to the reality of the case or the law. Uh, that, I think, is very much a, an education positive way of using Twitter. Okay. So this question is from Christopher Chan. With so many different communication tools, have you used any tools that combine link posting or, you know, linking those up of, of a Facebook account with, with Twitter tweets and, and instant messaging or something like that? Uh, actually, Twitter, Twitter clients like TweetDeck do a nice job of unifying some of that. And I think probably Seismic Desktop does it as well. If I want something to go to Twitter and Facebook, I just click the little Facebook box and it will go to both. There are other, friend feed I know is one tool I haven't used. Uh, it really depends on what your needs are. For me, Facebook is not something I look at frequently, so I haven't done that integration. I know other people for whom it's, it's a must do, and they're posting in parallel. There are also tools for taking your tweets and adding them automatically to a blog or a website. Because the Twitter API, the programming interface is public, people are finding a lot of ways of integrating Twitter into other tools and other media. Okay. All right. Well, I think we're a little long on time, so if I didn't get to your question or if you have any other questions for Professor Ezor, please uh, send me an email, agrothuis at cali.org. Again, look for this later uh, on Cal on a blip, calivideos.blip.tv, I'm sorry. Uh, professor, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Um, of course, I uh, encourage everyone to feel free to follow me on Twitter. Uh, unless you're interested in Palm stuff, the best place to find me is Prof Jonathan. 
and I'm, I'm happy to have you be part of that conversation. My email address is also on the screen, jezoratorolaw.edu. If anyone has questions, whether about Twitter or anything else I can be of assistance on, uh, I really appreciate Cali not only for this, of course, but for what it does uh, in my classroom to help me use technology to educate, whether it's um, through posting podcasts or all the other tools. I'm always happy to give a, a Cali award. Uh, so I wanted to thank uh, the Cali folks, and I look forward to future web webinars as well. Yes, and thank you so much for volunteering your time to do this. We really appreciate it. Of course. All right. I think that's it. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Professor Ezer.